What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Uh, today we begin a brief two-week series called The Spirit is Life, and, and our main scripture carrying us through it is from Romans 8.11, which says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. In the season of Easter, we celebrate that Jesus is raised from the dead, but we are also left wondering what the resurrection means for each of us. What does it mean when we are sick? What does it mean when tragedy strikes? What does the resurrection mean for a community that is still reeling from the pandemic? We are going to explore this together as we reflect on Romans 8, a chapter all about living in the Spirit. The book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament books. He wrote to Gentile converts and to the largely poor Jewish population that was forced to live in the ghettos outside of Rome. Part of the reason for this situation is because they had been kicked out of their city for a decade by the emperor. They have experienced immense pain. So when Paul writes, he is writing with racial reconciliation and cross-cultural sensitivity in mind. Let's listen to Romans 8, 1 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus was set, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put, the de put to death the deeds of the body you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And from Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, open our hearts. Help us to work through our pain and suffering. Help us to find you in this resurrection season. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A change is inevitable. Your life is going to change in one way or another, even if you do literally nothing, because life around you will change. This truth hit me full force after I had finished college. I returned back to my hometown, went back to my old job in a grocery store, and was very uncertain of what I should do now that I was done college. The first big change was when my parents told me they were moving to Florida. Uh, that meant I had to get an apartment. Then my roommate got deployed to South America, and some of my college friends moved into the apartment with me. One by one, though, um, these friends moved out and moved on to new things until finally my sister told me she was leaving the city too. That meant there were now no family members left in my hometown. So I decided it was time for me to move on too. 
I remember packing up everything I owned into my tiny little car. To this day, I don't know how I fit everything in it. After I packed, I drove down the street to stop at the store before I moved to this big city of Philadelphia. And when I got back to the car, I could not get it started. I had no idea what was wrong. The engine wouldn't even turn over, and I could not, for the life of me, figure out the problem. I was right on the verge of calling my uncle, who was a car mechanic, to share my complete embarrassment as all my possessions were packed up and the car would not start, when somehow I stumbled onto the solution. A car then had a mechanism that would lock the ignition if you turned the steering wheel too far while the car was parked. The solution was to turn the steering wheel until you heard a click. How I ever stumbled onto that solution, I'll never understand, but I was on my way finally with my whole world about to change. My new hometown of Philadelphia uh, was the biggest city I'd ever lived in, uh, and in the evening I was coming into rush hour traffic, more traffic than I had ever seen in my life. Uh, with my car filled up, I couldn't even see out the side windows to check my blind spots. So as I'm driving into the city on the highway, I was forced to change lanes blindly. I just threw up a prayer, Lord, this is it. I may lose everything, but here goes. I made it just fine, uh, but the idea of moving with no family, no support, no safety net, where one accident could change everything was terrifying. Change is inevitable, but I had no idea until then just how scary it could be. Now, I feel pretty blessed when it comes to how things turned out. I was in school. I didn't have much money. Everything I owned was either secondhand or free to me, but it's during that time that I made lifelong friends. I discovered who I really was, and perhaps most underrated of all, I realized my many, many shortcomings so that I could chart a path of the things to work on over the rest of my life. I connected to the United Methodist Church, and I met my wife. Everything I value in life today came after that scary and dramatic change in my life. But if you put me back in Buffalo again, facing that daunting decision to stay or go, I'm not sure I would make the same choice twice. It's hard to change. It's hard to remake your life how often can our lives change so dramatically? Now, the French novelist Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr once said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. That seems to ring true when we think about making change. When companies try and make changes, on average, two out of three of these change initiatives will fail. As much as we try and appeal to people's hearts and minds, most of our efforts to change things won't succeed. One of my favorite books given to me by my sister is called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. In it is a story of some moviegoers that were given a free soda and a bucket of popcorn. They were unknown participants in a study about mindless eating habits. One group was given a large bucket of, of popcorn they couldn't finish in one sitting, and the second was given an even larger bucket of popcorn. The point was to see if the size of the container we eat from affects our eating habits. Oh, and there was one more part to this study, too. Uh, the popcorn, it was terrible. It was made five days earlier. It was so bad, one person said it was like eating styrofoam, and two other people demanded their money back, even though it had been given to them for free. It was that bad. So what do you think happened with the popcorn? Did people eat more from a bigger container? You better believe they did. It did not matter how bad the food was, the mere fact that they ate from a larger bucket meant they ate more food. When the moviegoers were told afterward about the experiment, they were asked, do you think you ate more? And people replied, oh, no, stuff like that doesn't trick me. Yet the results were clear. People with larger buckets ate 53% more popcorn. The more things change, the more they stay the same. 
How many times do we get caught up thinking the changes happening around me don't affect me? I can't get tricked by stuff like that. I can't get thrown off my game. Sometimes we act as though we are invincible, as if change can't scare us or mess us up. Well, if the size of a popcorn bowl can make you eat more popcorn, I'm betting the changes in our homes, in our children, in our schools and towns, and even in our churches are going to challenge us. It's going to require something more of us to deal well with change. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul is sharing with his readers about a change that has happened. Judaism looked to the law to figure out how to live, how to be a good person and honor God. But now that Jesus has raised from the dead, all of that is up in the air. Is the law really the best way to live for God? And Paul is making a case for a new way of living. It's not about following the rules. That's not what makes you a good person. What makes you good is that Jesus Christ is alive in you. In the passage, we hear about the flesh and the spirit. And for some people, they think they know right away what Paul is saying. They think the flesh is sinful, it's evil, and anything that has to do with our bodies is bad. But that's not really right. Jesus became flesh, and he's not evil. So we have to be very careful here. Thinking the flesh is automatically bad is something called Neoplatonism. It is not Christianity. Paul would say the flesh is weak, yes, and dies eventually, true, but that's not the problem. The problem is that we try to live life our own way rather than through God's power and grace. We have to recognize that when we are faced with change, it's not that our flesh forces us to sin, it's that our flesh is weak. It's that we don't have the power and strength to live the kind of full and complete life God wants for us. The only way we can live well amidst big changes is through the power and presence of God. That's what's so fundamental about what Paul is saying. The law can help us see right and wrong, but because we are human, we are never going to win against our bodies. Even if we are good people, even if we like changes happening around us, eventually we wear out and die. The law doesn't really help us in that battle. So instead, we turn to Jesus. Jesus beat sin and death. Jesus perfectly embodies the power and presence of God. And he offers to each and every one of us that same hope of winning against our weak, fragile bodies. Here's the problem. A lot of us have in our head good and bad, an angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other. We think, most of the time, I listen to the angel, so I'm good enough. Every once in a while, I might do something bad, sure, but God doesn't punish me for that one bad thing mixed in with all the good things I do every day, right? And the answer is, that's not even the system God is using. God isn't evaluating your day-to-day -day actions like you are on a scale. If you do enough of the law right, then you live, but if you break the law, you die. No. Paul is telling us it's not two natures in one person. It's two categories of being. You either choose to live by your own power where you will inevitably die because the flesh is weak, or you live by God's power. And we know exactly what God's power gets us. Living with the power and presence of God brings life to us, just as it did to Jesus Christ. It means any change we go through is not met with our own power, trying to resist terrible, squeaky popcorn, or resisting a, a, an urge to curse, or lie, or cheat. It means God lives in us. Jesus is alive inside of you, so that when you are at wit's end, when you don't think you can do it, you're right. It's not you. It's God alive in you. 
who brought Jesus back to life, who did miracle after miracle through Jesus and the disciples, who transformed a generation of believers, who built the church and changed the world time and time again. It's that God at work in you that will get you through the problems you face. It's not a little angel on your shoulder. It's a God-centered life that puts God first and lets God's will take precedence in your life. That's how you can face big changes in your life. That's how you can find life in the midst of death. Here at Grace Church, we just found out about a pretty significant change. About a month ago, my wife announced that she was ready to make a transition away from the nursery school here at Grace and to start working in the public school. No big deal. It's a a, a big change for her, but a little one for the school. Then a few weeks ago, we found out that another teacher was getting ready to leave. Yikes! two teachers can be a huge change. Then last week, we found out Amy Hoffman, the director of the nursery school for 22 years, was resigning too. She was selling her house and moving to North Carolina to be closer to her daughter. She's actually moving to the same town I went to on vacation two weeks ago. How about that? Uh, But this is big. This is so big It has the potential to spook parents and sink the nursery school. And I was one of only a few people who knew about all these changes. And the question came to me and to the leaders here at Grace, how are we going to live? Are we going to live by the law, trusting the few meager resources we have in our human effort, or are we going to trust God? So, of course, I'm thinking about it. I'm praying. I'm wondering what the right move is. And the next morning, one of the staff comes to my office and says, let's talk. Now, this isn't just anyone. This is our head teacher. This is Donna Ernst, the very best of what our nursery school has to offer to our community. And she wants the job. She will be a brilliant next director. She even wants to work with me, so I know she is a great judge of character, and I am praising God. This is the best next thing that could happen at our school. Praise God that we didn't rely on our flesh to get us through this. We could have relied on our own resources. We could have tried to ring the alarm bells to get people to apply and try and rescue us from ourselves in this change, but instead the divine answer is there all along. The divine answer is not to trust in yourself, but to trust in God. Whatever you face, Jesus is with you, and the power of God will affect real change in the world around you. Now, I know doing this is not easy. It takes work and hard work to get to a place where we are living God-centered rather than self-centered lives, but the path to God-centered living is not impossible. In fact, there are small steps we can take right now that will help us to do exactly that. Those steps can look different for different people, but one thing we can all do is to consider what discipline we can add to our lives to help us get there. Let me give an example. You might not deal well with change, and it could cause you to be a really cynical person. And you know that's not God-centered living. You know your cynical attitude hurts people, and it hurts you too. So what can you do? Saying, I'm going to stop being cynical is as effective as someone watching TV eating snacks saying, I'm going to lose weight. It doesn't work that way. You have to do something. So maybe what you can do is develop a new routine. You say, I'm going to wake up every morning and name three things I'm thankful to God for. And you could say, once a week, I'm going to write a note to two people who did something worth celebrating. And third, you could have a swear jar for cynicism. Every time you say something overly critical, you have to put a dollar in the cynicism jar, and every month you have to donate that money to charity. Do you see how those kinds of habits can change you for the better? But it's not just about acting better or behaving better. It's about changing your mindset from one dependent on yourself to one dependent on God. I don't want to be cynical anymore, not just because it's a downer to the people around me, but because God is here. God is at work in my life 
so I am working to be able to see it to become God-centered. That's the kind of change that happens in our lives through the power of the resurrected Lord. What spiritual discipline might you take on to help you become God-centered like that? I want to share one last thing as we wrap up. Uh, many of you will have heard about this already, but a couple of weeks ago, Carol Frieswick wasn't feeling right. Uh, she's a longtime member here at Grace, and she had pain in her neck and was struggling to, to push her husband in his wheelchair. He, he's a big guy, so it's not all her fault, but she had a doctor's appointment, and she said, I have to talk to my doctor about this. So the appointment was the next day, and when she saw him, she explained all her symptoms, and at the very end, he said, you know, I'd like to do an EKG just in case. And when he did, he saw something that wasn't right. He's, he told her he wanted her to see a heart specialist right away, like in an hour. And Carol is in a bit of a panic. This is not a change she expected. This is not a change she wanted. But in her flesh, she is powerless. She was told to stay in the area until the appointment was set, and as she's waiting, she decided to come to the church and talk with me. She relayed all this information and said, will you pray with me, which I did, of course. And at the end of the prayer, she said, oh, I knew this was the right place to come. I feel so much better. And I have to tell you, folks, my prayer was not anything special. It was genuine, yes. It was earnest, absolutely. But Carol even said, you didn't say anything I didn't already know, but it was exactly what I needed to hear. Any of you could have prayed that prayer. Any of you could have reminded Carol that God sometimes heals in the physical, and at other times he is healing something much deeper. God is healing our broken souls. And that is not a little thing. What was divine in that prayer was Carol's openness to God. She heard the Lord speak to her, and it brought her peace that goes beyond human understanding. Her physical heart had not changed one bit, but her heart was radically transformed. A couple of days later, she was in the operating room to have a stent put in. I visited her that afternoon, and I asked her how she was doing. She said, I'm perfectly fine. She told me she was at peace ever since she was in my office. The next day, she headed home, and she continues to be on the mend. Carol is living a God-centered life. What a world it would be if we were all living with that kind of faith, that kind of trust that God is not only here with us, but is on our side, moving in power to restore us. We don't live by the law trying to do the right thing in our own strength. We live by faith, trusting in the Spirit of God. It's that Spirit that will restore each of us and will restore this church, not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.